and we are live welcome to the show on cx fails already had a cx fail we're three minutes late <laughs> because of me i failed i failed myself and my technology failed me so doesn't that sound familiar folks it, i feel like that's like the ultimate yeah. cx case study actually like i implemented yeah. something that promised was going to be foolproof cx yep and i'm no we fool are. but still not foolproof i mean that's the ultimate problem here right Yes. Yeah. So the holiday edition, CX highs and lows with Liz and Nicole. This is going to be fabulous. Uh, I called the Liz and Nicole show because I learned last time that pretty much lose control of the show when these two are on. But that's that's cool. Uh, we can do we can do it that way. Uh, who better to turn the show over to than these two ladies, Thomas? We're a little rusty. Was, yeah, yeah. We got to get you warmed up again, uh, Thomas. Yeah. Welcome. Glad now that Thomas is here, I know things are going to be spicy. Exactly. So, he did um, promise to show up, so that's good. We got did. we got our one audience member. We do, we do. We have our one. Well, don't forget times however many passive participants. I don't know what the right. current metric and is. And Sven but. will be here soon, right? Like he'll be here. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. Wait, probably with a glass of glue vine. I hope. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's that time of year. Uh Thomas wants to know, Liz, if CX is for fools. Um it did, anyway. did, I'm sorry. Did Thomas just call me a fool on a Friday? Like, I don't understand. Thomas, I thought we liked each other. Like, I thought we got over the whole Liz isn't really German thing. And I thought we were like. All right. Well, it sounds like something to work out after the show. <laughs> messaging that's, that's a therapy session. By the way, Liz and I figured out how you can add Stripe to um, uh, to Calendly. So yeah. we're, we're registering openings for therapy sessions. So feel free to excellent. Book them. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. We'll get to that. So for those of you who are here for uh, holiday awards, warmth, tribute, and emotional send-offs, you're the wrong <laughs> place. I, I hope you were at, at the excellent CRM play as yesterday. yesterday. Right. Like yeah. I hope you want yeah. I hope you went to that if you wanted kindness. Like this is yeah, exactly. This a is we're show. getting real. Yeah. Where we're get we're getting real today. Though I do want to say, as far as awards, we are in the presence of an award winning analyst, Liz yeah. Miller. Oh yeah. Analyst it's only because Nicole left. This is what I'm convinced of. Not, it was like they were like, Oh, Nicole isn't here. Oh, it, Liz not. took over that crap. So let's give wow. it to her. <laughs> so folks, this is what analyst of the year really looks like in the flesh. And and Nicole, since you were last on, you have moved to a different role. And uh -huh. you have sort of left the analyst profession, though you never really leave the analyst profession, as no. we know. No. So, yeah. uh, so we're gonna give you a chance for a shameless plug if you behave yourself later in the broadcast. So, uh, yes. but what we're gonna be doing today, folks, is counting out the highs and the lows of, of CX in in 2021. I may have a few <laughs> myself because I was just Ready. talking with uh, Samir Patel over at SAP about their CX strategy, which has had its ups and downs. So that was a good reminder <laughs> of some of the things that get under my skin with CX, but also the immense possibilities, which is why we actually care, right? Yeah. So, I think that should be really. that should be SAP's CX's official tagline. Okay. Why care? Yeah. Why no, immense care? possibilities. Oh, no. I, I thought... Why oh, no. Why care? care? Are we going with yeah. why care? Because that's fine. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, but by the way, just a little side note, I don't want to do a total spoiler here, but one of the most funniest things on this year of succession on HBO, uh, or, was it, or was it last year? I'm, I'm maybe getting the years wrong because I did a binge, but um, it was this tagline, we hear you. It was supposed to be all awesome. And then they figured out that they had a line of TVs that actually does eavesdrop on people. So then they had to like <laughs> scramble before they were going to announce the tagline and say, oh shit, we actually do hear you. And so they're like, oh crap, what do we do? Anyway, I thought that was kind of a perfect segue to today. That is perfect. Conversation. So, uh, so yeah. And, and folks in the audience, uh, I know Thomas, you're going to have a few things to say about this. Uh, so feel free to contribute your own personal highs and lows as as we go and let's just see where the conversation leads from there. So, uh, so let's start with the low points. Cause we got to get kind of the spleen out, I think before we can get into the festive mood here. So uh, Liz, since you're analyst of the year and we just kind of travel in your wake, um, what is your sort of top B force or number five okay. or whatever for what's getting number under five, your skin this year? Countdown. We're going to do the countdown, right? Oh, yeah. Let's go from oh. five to one. Oh, okay. Nicole leaving. Oh, wow. So, so my number. Me up here, like, right. 
Was it going to be the number five beef? Was it going to be the number one beef? Yeah. I got abandoned on my CX boat here all by myself. I See, I used to just have to have the marketing paddle, right. which was fine, because there were plenty of people to hit with the marketing paddle. But then this one has to leave me with all of the paddles. That's my number. Yeah. That's my number five CX beef, John. But well, I did write it nicely on a piece of paper. I thought you'd you be did. proud of it. I, I do on that paper, you. that paper looks yeah. like ramen. I just need you to. Visual just, stimulus. It does look like ramen. You need you, I just needed you to see that. Okay. That's well, my number Nicole, five. I promise no emotional moments, but if you if you do feel a tear welling up after that, I understand. <laughs> no, I, be, it's because like, we talk to so each bad. other still almost like every day. We do. We do. Like nothing really has changed in our nothing. relationship. We just no longer collect paychecks from the same uh, authorizer. True. So that's pretty True that. Much, that's pretty much the difference. Um, but Liz, you know, as usual, showing me up because uh, here I am, although I have now finally a real whiteboard in my office, I'm not in my office, so I don't have my whiteboard. Oh, uh, um, well. See how the ruled notebook, not quite as good, Liz, as the ramen yeah. post it. So I True. wrote mine down okay. in, a very, in a very messy, like no one can read it kind of way. So like, I don't feel like I've given anything away there. Um, I think one of my personal lows and I'm just going to start from like the full on, like as a population perspective, I'm loading at the ports. I mean, come on, this has just been one of the biggest disasters yeah. in oh, so, mm -hmm. so many ways. And I'm going to say as a Southern Californian who lives in Southern California again, even including a nice little oil spill. So like really not that awesome, you know? Mm. Yeah. Did, did, like, did anybody try ordering an appliance this year? Anybody else have this experience? Yeah, like, that's not, hi. yeah, no, anything. Apparently anything that needs to go over water, just forget it. Yeah, forget it. Mm. Yeah, I think we have some wa washers and dryers in my building that said something about like next year sometime. Mm -hmm. that, Probably. Probably. So, some yeah. shit Although, outside of Taiwan I'll, or something. I'll say that everyone seems to be using supply chain as a bit of an excuse too, which is kind mm. of irritating because like, so I'll give you the, for example, um, Christmas cards that we ordered in November uh, were shipped at the beginning of the month. And according to the shipping company that rhymes with Schmedex, um, they're held mm. up because of the storms in Kentucky, what, what horrible storms, people have died. Like my heart goes out to everyone in, that was covered by that. Here's the mm. problem. Okay, in this digital world where your package gets scanned every single time it stops someplace, my package is stuck in the supply chain of San Jose, the city yeah. where I live. So the tornadoes in Kentucky are making it impossible for San Jose to find and deliver my package. Stop lying. I know. I will. I will say, mm. a, you know, a really closely related beef. So I'm just going to wrap it up into this one because it will allow me to cram more in. Is automated delivery updates that are not based on real information. Like anybody else been getting those this year? So, like it, as you say, one half of the problem, Liz, is knowing that's where some like, something supposedly really is, and knowing that that has very little impact. <laughs> where it's going to get to. The right. other thing is getting an update that is just completely based on whatever mythology is in the system somewhere that is totally disconnected from reality. Totally. Yeah. It'll be delivered tomorrow. Okay. Mm. That's interesting because like it hasn't dispatched from anywhere. So <laughs> I'm really kind of intrigued as to how that's going to happen. And sure enough, it doesn't show up. It doesn't show up in the anymore. metaverse. It's just going to happen. Nicole. It's just <sighs> hold that. Thought, yeah. Hold that. <laughs> I actually, I think it'd be kind of cool if you had delayed deliveries in the metaverse as well. It would add an error. <laughs> that would be great. Can you imagine? Realism. But it'll be yeah. shared, John. It's going to be fine. <laughs> now, now, Thomas has a CX low. It doesn't sound like he's taken this very well because it's an interaction with an online bank. Everything on paper, uh, including stuff that has expiry dates. It's unresolved since early March. I'm concerned that Thomas is having problems with his bank. This is, yeah, banks probably shouldn't be the ones leading CX gripe sessions. Like that's not no, no, where we should be. That doesn't look good. Uh, but yeah, if anyone else has, has your highs and lows, start with the lows here. Let's get this off of our, our chest. One okay. thing I was struck by in a recent interaction with, with Walmart, which I'm going to probably refer to as several times in our conversation today. Well, one thing was that the, I had, 
I became fascinated in the CX purgatory that I was in. And I decided to, you know, mine the material for a blog post, right? It's just kind of like, that's what you do, right? So instead of like just hating every moment of my life, I decided that this was research, you know? (laughs) And, and, and one of the things that happened to Cole is exactly what you, one of the reps I interacted with in the chat just basically lied to me. I realized he gave me basically fake delivery stuff. Yeah. And uh, I figured out later that they actually don't, didn't know where the stuff was anyway. They had no yeah. idea. So, but, but what, here's the thing that really interested me though. And I think this is like, we talk about sort of the future of CX, right? And you think about like the possibilities here, but also the, the amazing, a uh, gap between where we want to be and where we are. I read before the holidays, right, that Walmart and Amazon were really the two that were investing so much in supply chain right now, so as to be the leaders in this area where so many other retailers were going to have all these problems and fall short. And then here I am having this nightmare experience with Walmart. Now, granted, it was a little bit of an exceptional product, uh, an action figure, if you want me to be totally honest. Oh, yeah. Not my deal, but a holiday <laughs> thing, right? It's a collectible, um, John. It's, it's a collectible. Yes, oh, right, exactly. right. It's a collectible, exactly. right. It's it's not an overgrown male fantasy of someone that's collectible. Be, gotten gotten over it by now. Anyway, um, but uh so <laughs> so what I was really struck by was not I know that Walmart has a sophisticated international logistics operation, but I, what I was fascinated by was that the the reps had absolutely no transparency or visibility into that system, right? So they wanted to help. They were eager to help. Uh, They weren't unintelligent. Um, They were pretty smart, but they had no visibility. And so their hands were tied behind their backs. And so what what did they have instead? What they had instead was all this like absurd training around being polite and nice. Empathy. Right. Yeah. Oh, I'm empathetic, but I can't help. So. It, it, it would be kind of like if a waiter took your food order with their hands tied behind their back and they came back and said, Hey, you know, uh, I can't actually bring you your food, but it's really great food. We're still working you know? on it. Yeah. You yeah. know, so they have all the great skills of empathy, but they can't actually solve my problem. And I think I, I just thought it was so interesting because if Walmart is struggling with this, with all the vast resources they have, like what is the state of this industry right now? As far as when you try to connect this through, try to connect these three very delicate things, right? CX on the Omni channel, supply chain, and then don't forget employee experience piece, yep. right? Like, yep. like, yep. like these, this is why this is so intractable on some level I, in my, in my opinion, but also it's why it's exciting, right? I mean, isn't this why you care? Both of you care because it's a meaty, interesting challenge, right? Well, it, it's about the information, but also the training and the empathy. I mean, I, I'm just going to say, it's good to know that somewhere, evidently, someone has put together the Dilbert handbook for customer service because that sounds like exactly like a you know, like a daily calendar page that someone mm. put into practice. So I'm gonna call that the silver lining, John, of you know, the really dark gray Walmart CX bomb. Right. <laughs> but yeah. they, I, there we go. But I also think they also kind of get themselves, a lot of folks are getting themselves into trouble, right? Because especially in things like stock calls and earnings calls when they're like, we're winning with CX and we have a winning CX. We've implemented winning CX platforms and we have CX training. And and people have kind of really leaned into this idea that by investing in customer experience, everything's going to be okay. Okay. And then when everything goes off the rails and it's unintentional, right? Like it's not like anyone's sitting in the fulfillment center, like, you know what? F you, John. You don't get this collectible. I don't like right. you. Hmm. Like they're not actually and they're sitting there doing and they're that, like, right? Like staring at it. Yeah. Right. There's yeah. no naughty and yeah. nice list in the fulfulfillment center. That'll but teach I, you a I lesson think... for obsessing about action figures. Exactly. Your age. Exactly. But call it a doll again, John. You, know? you, you don't. You don't deserve it. No. But it, it is interesting because I think um, what we're looking at here too is um, the challenge that you know investing and having objectives is not the same as outcomes. And I think right. the, the reality is CX is all about outcomes. And it always has been. It's ironic that in a lot of ways, it's actually harder now than it was back in the analog days when it really was all about how you dealt with the person in front of you. And it, many, many things are much, much simpler. And yet in, in a whole lot of ways, We've made that basic kind of communication and interaction a hell of a lot harder, but it's also because 
there's so much complexity that goes into something that that you know genuinely is far more sophisticated than it was back in the analog past. So if there's a whole lot of screaming. Yeah, but, but it, it's not unreasonable that it's harder. But let's acknowledge that this is not about effort and attempts. It's about right. outcomes, and that that leads you to a very different way of prioritizing what you do and how you do it, and what your fail safes are. Mm. It brings me to my number four. Can I say my number four? Yeah, let's hear your number four. Peloton. Uh-huh. Wow, you're, we're, we're calling out. We're calling out brands. Peloton's yeah. on the list. Huh? So, yeah. so, so Peloton is the example of the beef okay. that I have, which is when you panic and listen to the noise of the crowd versus taking a beat and remembering that CX is a strategy that helps you listen to your crowd right, is fundamentally based on listening to your crowd. So if you remember back almost two years ago to the date, right, Peloton releases an ad with the impossibly beautiful, already skinny, like this amazing young woman who was like, thank goodness my husband bought me a Peloton because now I can be beautiful and smart and accomplished and I'm going to work out every day and start like a whole new fitness obsession that's probably going to land me in some kind of mental health ward. So they release that. The crowd goes bonkers. Ryan Reynolds' team comes out with a hysterical viral video that was absolutely hysterical because it picked on all the things that the crowd and, quite frankly, Peloton's crowd already laugh at, right? The impossible apartments that the Peloton lives on, like the special room with the platform and the lighting that you've built for your Peloton. No one does it, right? So while everyone's laughing at how absurdly wrong Peloton reflects its culture. What does Peloton do? They freak out and they're like, no, no, it's about her self-esteem. And and they freak out because they fundamentally missed an opportunity. We got the attempt. Yeah. yeah. Right. They they missed the opportunity to reflect who their customer is and why their customer loves Peloton and being part of the community. Let's fast forward two years. They do it again. Right. Spoiler alert. A dude dies on a TV show, so not even real life, fake dude dies on a fake Peloton taking a fake class after his thousands ride. Peloton freaks out, but they think they're being funny this time. So they go to Ryan Reynolds, the group that made the viral video picking on him the first time, and create a new ad to explain and try to exploit and take over a news cycle about the Sex and the City reboot. Oh, he didn't die because he was on the bike and it helps cardiovascular disease. They hire a guy who's now under investigation for sexual assault. All the things that could go wrong. Wow. And, in a campaign yeah. go wrong because yeah. once again, and it's not because they hired Chris knows it's not because of that. it's because they forgot something, a Peloton customer in the Peloton community that loves riding with Cody or love. They're also sex in the city fans whose reaction to the death wasn't about the Peloton. It was about that women in our fifties are dealing with lots of stuff and grief happens say- to be one of them. We should have had the spoiler alert there, Liz, on that. I did kind of say spoiler. I'm not saying. Yeah, you did. You did. But anyway. Sorry, Thomas. I know, Thomas. I'm sorry. I just ruined Sex and the City. (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure Thomas is like devastated at the moment. I know. Uh, know. Sorry about that, dude. You're going to have to come up with another binge watch for the whole. Exactly. But that's my CX beef. That it's, it's missing the opportunity to be authentic with your customer because you just aren't listening and you react in this big, crazy reaction they get you smacked in the face every single time. Stop getting smacked in the face. Unless you like it, in which case, okay, fine. Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was, it's, it's like some weird psychological thing that they can't get out of. I don't know. I, I think it's because people panic. Like, they want to explain it. Yeah. Like, if, yeah. if, like, if a viral video, like, shows a clerk in a store having a really bad day, the brand's knee-jerk reaction is to explain it rather than just saying... Yeah, she had a really tough customer and she had a really bad day. Moving on to Tuesday, right? We we feel this need to go big because we feel that the crowd is really yelling, but we forget that our crowd understands what experience just happened. So just like, just send an email. This is the bottom line. Own it. Don't explain it. There you go. This is why we share a brain still. It's true. Yeah. This is why I turned over my show. (laughs) <laughs> but um, but but no, uh, I think the other interestingly ironic piece is Peloton's one of the few brands where 
where the pandemic economy kind of fell in their lap. So they probably should have just played to their strengths, right? Wow. But they've also, but, it, it, it fell in their laps, absolutely, but then they couldn't really figure out how to sustain it, right? Yeah. So the answer was, I mean, I think the thing we learned about Peloton, at least from a CX perspective, through the pandemic was they're a product company, just like everyone else, right? Because right. they sold the bike, sold the bike, sold the bike, everyone wanted a bike. So what did they do? They didn't look for new business models. They didn't look for different ways to deliver content. They didn't look for ways to monetize their community. They didn't look for a new business model or a pivot. They introduced another product that was a fitness equipment thingy. Like because they, they went right back. One. Because you need another one, Lynn. Right, because now enough. I need a treadmill. Yeah. You're just like, what? No, no, I don't. Yeah. Well, and it, it's ironic because, you know, we've talked for a long time about the move from products to services and, you know, from services to software and all this kind of stuff. And, and granted, that's in the IT space. But, you know, we were all kind of looking at Peloton as a great example of the same thing happening mm -hmm. in the consumer space. And they kind of just, you know, missed a trick. It was like that chain came off, except there's not I don't think there's actually a chain on the Peloton. <laughs> but you now it was like the chain came off the, the pedals and that, you know, like kind of not quite back on there yet. Like the service is actually, and the community yes. are actually really, really key parts of the value that their customers have. So, you know, we can come back to that one. I will say in a, in a somewhat similar vein, and this, I swear, John, the only time we cheated on this whole setup, but um, we, we both thought about this independently first. But my number four is a slightly different variation on this. It is that as we see these companies starting to blur the boundaries of what kind of markets they're actually in, suddenly brands that we love don't love each other anymore. And I'm just going to say, like one prime example, Peloton and Lululemon in litigation, patent, lit patent infringement litigation. So Peloton used to produce athletic wear with Lululemon, then stopped and made their own Lululemon patent infringement lawsuit. Now, bear in mind, at the same time, of course, this is Lululemon that now owns a mirror. So these two companies that evidently, you know, were not at all head to head competitors, suddenly they're they're all up in each other's business. And it's kind of interesting. Um, and honestly, I think as a customer, it's pretty damn confusing. Mm. You know, so uh, how, how will this all play out? I don't know, but I kind of can't help but feel like maybe a little, maybe we live, maybe we need to go do some, um, some webinars on competition for these folks. And possibly to explain either that, that or you know, we have to explain to Thomas that it's okay. If he wears a too tight t-shirt every once in a while, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, so, like I, yeah. So Thomas is getting apparel suggestions for women from Peloton. That's unfortunate. I mean, you know, like I, the two tight is not so much a problem. Just like I'm going to say, the neckline risk being really wrong for you, Thomas. And that's, yeah, I would. It's, it's not like the color tolerant. choices. I yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I don't know, Thomas. I think if you get the women in your life some nice Peloton equipment for the holidays, I think I don't think you're going to have any more further problems. So <laughs> maybe they're actually doing a good job, not a bad well, job. You know, um, I will say this does bring me neatly to my next uh, beef, CX beef. All right. so I'm going to I'm going to jump the, do it. jump the line on this one, Liz. I know you're going to appreciate this one. Programmatic ads on ah. internet television on internet television. Okay, so now I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say I don't understand why this is so hard. So <laughs> you have my IP address. You know you know exactly what I'm watching. You probably have some decent information about what my patterns of watching those things are. So why do I get the random truck ads in Spanish? I mean, you know, it's not a huge problem. Understand it, you know, reasonably well. Mark understands them better. I've occasionally had ads in Vietnamese as well. So n never mind the fact that often I'm getting the same damn ad like so many times that I might have felt neutrally or even positively about whatever product is being advertised to me. Like, don't get me started on Nissan's. But I see the same damn ad so many times. I just like, I'm out. I am hard. No, like don't ever want to see it again. This is totally backfired. And I think it's really a shame because all the people that are spending advertising budget on this have no way of knowing 
that they have actually just completely pissed me off and I will no. never be a customer as a result. Because they're like, it got served. It got served. Too, and too, too damn many times. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In, in a one hour show. Yeah. Can I just attempt to share my screen for a minute? Let's see how this works. Please uh, let it be an ad in Vietnamese because that's really going to just be epic. Let's see how this goes. Uh, oh, it's a select window. It doesn't seem to like this. Okay, I guess I'm going to have to... StreamYard really dislikes you today. I don't wow. know. StreamYard, yeah. StreamYard is like not happy with me at the moment, but I I need to try this because it's just too on topic. Let me just try one other thing, <laughs> see if it works. Uh, Do it on your phone, John. Show it on your phone. Let's try entire screen. Oh, okay. 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 Can you see it? Ooh, oh, ah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. All right, so, so have a look. Turn off YouTube advertising personalization in a last ditch effort to get this end times fitness clown shilster out of my video streams. <laughs> we'll keep you posted. Who, who right. is this? Who is this yeah. buffoon? Uh, this, is, this guy is really brutal. So confused about everything that appears on that screen too. Like apparently it wants you to eat better and watch that guy. I know. I know. What have you been searching for? Uh, you know, it it does start to raise some alarm bells. Um, yeah. But the interesting thing is how many other people, you know, uh, apparently normal people are seeing way too much of this guy because I got a bunch of replies. <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, they're like, get this guy out of, let me know if it works. Get this guy out of my life. Right. You know, <laughs> well, it's like, and well, anything- I mean, Joe McKendrick from ZD- ZDNet, for Christ's sakes. Um, <laughs> He's like, get him. this guy out of my yeah. life. Yeah. And, and Joe's, I don't think Joe is like, I don't, I am pretty confident Joe is doing normal searches. Let's just put it that way. Uh, it's like so. a Honda ad, you know, where where the elf, like the Honda guy, is trying to help Santa. He's like, "All I did was Google who's been naughty." <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you know, shameless. Like, exactly. That really does make me laugh. <laughs> the worst uh, is, I don't understand. Like, so my daughter will watch every bad, like. Any kid who wants to review a toy, guess what? My my kid's your subscriber. Like I get, they they absolutely drive me bonkers. So instead of like intuitively, I thought that YouTube would just be serving me an endless stream of toy ads, right? Because we're watching all of these videos mm-hmm. with toys in them. No, yeah. instead, my daughter gets ads about like all the grown up things were searching like here's how you can you know here's jiffy lube and like all like the car repair home repair i'm like and so and she gets really confused she's like mommy i like paint i'm like okay we're moving on like we can't they've just completely gotten it wrong (laughs) it's just like it's so interesting because it's like again we're making stuff harder than it used to be mm -hmm. because you know regular broadcast television during the children's shows what did they advertise Toys. Cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, so, no, not that one. No, that was illegal. Liz. That was the other one. You know, you know what's yeah, really we were kids. You know what's really interesting though, because like, I think nineteen out of twenty times that personalized advertising feels very toned up, and then around yeah. one out of twenty times there's a real creepy one that you try to remember how to, like, like, like I remember one the other day where I was on the phone but not my cell phone, my landline talking about something, and then I saw a targeted ad for the same thing on, on my computer, like weird stuff like that, where I'm like, you know, are my Amazon devices like serving? You know, know here's here's the thing. Honestly, it's, it's not that stuff is listening to you. I like, I know cause everyone, I think it's the number one question people will ask me because like the minute they find out that I'm in marketing and I, if I know anything about advertising technology, they're like, okay, so I was talking to my friend about how I think her boyfriend is cheating on her. And like, and it just be this really long conversation about lots of weird stuff. And then they served me an ad for the show cheaters. Right. Were they listening to me? I'm like, no, you're just a no. woman of a certain age who watches yeah. bad TV. Mm-hmm. Like they it's not like, like I think they're serving up. So they're right. Like, like next you're gonna get mob yeah. wives. Calm down. Yeah. Like it's like Yeah, but there is a whole digital exhaust thing that is being applied in oh. certain cases. And and like obviously that Without you know, that's an extreme example of like being eavesdropped on, but like but, but I, there is yeah. this um, there is this creep factor that emerges. So I think that's what's interesting is that most of the time it's tone deaf and every now and then it's overly creepy. But there's like the middle ground has not been achieved, right? Well, it's because we're terrible people. 
Like John, yeah. fundamentally, marketer, like we we are terrible people who have adopted this really awful language that's intensely violent. That's like, actually like, a good explanation. It's um, no, really, like, on, okay, just sit back and think about it for just a second. Like, think about how marketers talk. And I say this because I am a marketer, right? Like, I I am talking of my own people right now. We wage campaigns. Okay, it's us and the military. It's marketers and the military, and we're waging campaigns because what With do we targets. do? Right. Yeah. We segment out our audience. So in other words, we call the herd and make sure we get everyone in one area. And then we target them by blasting things at them. And then we go back to our offices and we go, oh, I hope something goes viral. Like chicken, like like smallpox on a blanket. We hope something goes viral. We're not a good people. Like we have this really oh, awful Liz. language, but it is bad. It is bad. What I will say, the other funny thing is, is if you ever, if you're ever super nerdy like Nicole or myself, because let's be real, Nicole would totally do this just like I would. Um, if you ever read Carl von Clausewitz on war, a lovely tome about you know war and well intelligence, he d when it's it's where the phrasing "fog of war" comes from, right? So when you talk about what the fog of war is, right? Uh, the, all the generals used to sit on their horses at the very top. Right. And then there'd be like the big canyon and that's where all the fighting would happen. So you send all the people like you send everyone in the red shirts down to the bottom of the gully and you let them fight. Right. And what happens is all the fog gathers on the top. So when you're a general and you're looking in, you're like, God, I wonder who's dead. I wonder, yeah, is it going well? Hmm. Yeah. Oops. So the concept of fog of war was there's so much stuff that happens in between you and what your objectives and everything that you would like to have happen is that what you need need and the way Carl referred to it is a piercing mind of intelligence to cut through the fog to bring back what is happening on the ground back up to the general so better decisions yep. could be made like Carl von Klauswitz wrote the first marketing book mm. well you know it's funny it's funny Liz because I was going to go to exactly the same place because as usual we are connected at the brain but you know, my analogy was going to be like what we're trying to do in marketing in a lot of these cases is basically like fly a drone over, and that's our intelligence. And so we're looking at this all very, very superficially, and we might identify things that are you know empirically true, but don't actually explain what the hell is going on with customers and what they really care about. Because you know, the only way that you can actually get to that understanding is by asking your customers and by asking them the right questions. And there wait, are a whole lot of different ways of doing it, depending on what type of business you're in and what type of customers you have, but it, it's got to come from the horse's mouth. If anyone else needs more proof that Nicole and I actually share a brain. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, wow. exactly. You guys. Exactly. So let's do this one first. Uh, workflow? Not, not a journey. journey. No. No. It's not a journey, people. Stop calling a workflow a journey. You're going to make me mad. Then there's this one. Oh, wait, here's the camera. Yeah, no, no. Wow. Like asking your customer and deploying a survey after a negative experience or, or after, after they hung up the phone. Your customer had the temerity of calling in to find out where their package was. And so what do you do the minute you hang up that phone? Well, you deploy a survey to find out survey. how great that person yeah. was. Yeah. That mm -hmm. survey is only going to be filled out. It's going to be filled out 80% of the time by the same 20% of the population that wanted to tell you what they actually thought about you in that moment. It's not actually customer voice. Please stop pretending that it is. I, I would like to actually say that one of my favorite uh, posts in my history of eight years of cranking out ridiculous amounts of content at Diginomica is the survey epidemic is upon us and something must be done um <laughs> which unfortunately so, was a little too pointed john <laughs> from where we yeah. are right now but yes yeah, yeah. i no, mean literally um and and just so you guys know <clears throat> in 30 seconds we're gonna be sending out a survey about how the program yeah. is going yeah so, give us five stars uh, yeah. you'll be happy to know um, that they're all bounded questions and there's right. no free text response right so, be sure yeah. to tip your waitress yeah. Mm -hmm. No, we're yeah. literally, it, it's getting to the point now where it's like, um, how did, how did your floss go, John? Yeah. You know, uh, it went pretty and don't well. you want to just hit one? You know? Like I'm that mean person that will just hit one because I build surveys for a living where I'm like one, yeah. one, one, know, one. I'm also the person that will click every single sponsored ad because if you're a brand, I don't necessarily like, I know it costs you like a dollar. There you go. I know. See, 
So Thomas, we will get to your CX and platform question, which by the way, is a really loaded question. Uh, <laughs> Thomas, another CX fail caused by streamer. No, um, yeah. that one was me actually. <laughs> that, I, was, I was switching views and stuff. So I think that that caused that, but um, right. yeah. What's and by the way, wonderful? by the way, you can be like Thomas and, and actually say something. So I know there's some people watching that are not commenting but please feel free that's the whole point of this program i actually do and more the merrier yeah absolutely although i do get the feeling, i get the feeling that less people are watching cx and more experiencing it right now shopping than they're yeah. actually on this program yeah. at the moment but anyhow i'll i'll target the living hell out of people with replays after the fact too, uh -uh. So. yeah and well, it'll come with gonna... a survey it'll have a survey so Right. Please fill it out. It will only take about 20 minutes because it'll be our net promoter. <laughs> yeah. And exactly. what is up with these like eight page surveys too, right? Like where you start with like, yes, was it well, a good or bad experience? Then suddenly you're like lost in the weeds. Developer. It's the citizen developer, John. Anyone can oh. build a survey. Right. That isn't that or, or it's product development. That's my other favorite one. When retail, yeah. when retail brands, like when, um, like, like a clothing company that I, I shop at a lot for my daughter will send these like, we want you to be part of your next great experience. I'm like, oh God. Okay. Like for funsies, I'm going to click on it. And it's like a 30 minute survey asking me which pattern that looks exactly like the pattern that you sold me this season of dress. Like, what do you think of this? What, what would you pay for this? And so I undervalue everything where I'm like, I'd only pay $9 for that. I did, I did, okay, let's wrap up our beefs because we're going to run say, out of time like, for the good stuff. I know, I know. Okay, so, so I, I will do we just, have do I, we have any more beefs that really need need airing? I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right to my number one. Okay, and this was alluded to earlier. Metaverse. I mean, come on, people. Like, okay. <laughs> first of all, first of all, total misinterpretations of what it what it really is or will likely be. But contrast that with what we have all been living through for the last two years. I don't know about you guys. I want the real. I want to go to real places. I want to see real people. I want to do mm. real things in real life. And I'm over it. I'm, you know what? I'm good with the concept of having a shared experience with someone that I choose to have an immersive shared experience with. Right. I mean, like you, you and I do that all, every day. Though. We so, do it all the time. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. and if you and I chose to like don some ridiculous VR glasses, then Mark and Scott would take pictures and send it to John and it would be fine. Yeah, but, yeah. but at the end of the day, like, do I, do I really want to spend so much time worrying about it? No, not necessarily. No, but, um, yeah. oh, here's my, here's my CX beef. Number one. Okay. Number one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So here's that the problem. Good. Um, yeah. Like what, like five, six years ago, remember when every CMO, like the top of their resume, they got rid of the line of I'm a data driven CMO and they exchanged that with I'm a CMO that owns customer experience, right? Because we all wanted to talk about owning customer experience. So every marketer like woke up in the morning and was like, I shall own customer experience. And then people started getting fired for it. So we took the hot potato and we threw it, right? And marketers figured out, like, actually what we could say that we own is driving growth for our organizations. And we can actually, you know, we can actually prove that. We can measure it. We can put business goals against it. We're going to stand over here in growth land. See you later. Bye. And we threw the hot potato out into the cafeteria. And unfortunately, um, customer service and customer support have wandered into the cafeteria and have found the hot potato. I think they and got kind of hit in the head by the hot potato. They, maybe like some, in, some, you know? some got hit yeah. in the head by the hot potato for sure, but they're now all trying to pick it up and you'd be very hard pressed. And I think it's largely being driven by our friends, the vendors whom, you know, I love and adore you all, but the more we keep trying to convince a specific function or an individual department or a specific leader that they own CX, it's, it's like telegraphing that your intent is to fail. Because if you're going to own it, that means you're going to stick it in a silo, put it in a drawer, wrap it up in a bow. And all the things that John was talking about, about supply chain needing to be integrated, data needing to be integrated, the departments needing to be integrated. The minute someone's like, ha ha, I own it. I'm the champion of customer experience. That's mm. yeah, done. So what, what would you prefer? Grandeur. What would you prefer as sort of a method, methodological alternative to owning someone owning it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here because this is something Liz and I have actually discussed quite a bit over time. And part of the problem is what the hell you call it. Because 
Mm. We have toyed with CX ops. We've toyed with customer ops. Both of those things sound like kind of machines that you can get stuck in and lose an arm, you know, like not that good. Um, I, I think it's, I think this is where we come to Liz, what you said, just to like go back to our touchy feely day yesterday with the inimitable Paul Greenberg, somebody who explains CRM is a strategy. And that's really, I mean, CX is an objective, it's a philosophy, and it's a yep. way of working. It is a guiding principle. It is for not everyone. Something. You can have you can have people who foster it. You can have stewards of CX. Yeah. Nobody owns it. Nobody owns it. The customer is actually the one who is closest to owning it for right. themselves. And it's a misnomer. We should have just called it customer's experience from the very beginning, but the apostrophe S felt inconvenient, right? Yeah. So at, at the end awkward, of the day, you know? yeah, yeah, it's a little awkward, you know, but I, I also think that the reality here is that for, for organizations, we need to get back to being very specific about what part of the delivery of the strategy known of customer experience we are going to spearhead. Right. So yeah. if marketing is going to have a piece of that, great, let's define it because then customer service and support can help bolster that, can help amplify it. If customer service is going to be that front line that deals with all the ugly, the bad, the calls, the ang- great, how do we support that? But because we're all busy fighting over who gets to eat the potato, we've mm-hmm. left the customer in a space where they are turning to self service and not with the organizations they've traditionally turned to. Right. They're they're looking for self-service in ways to get around our infrastructures, to get around all these clouds that we've built around our silos, while our teams are just trying to figure out how to use half the stuff we're forcing them to use. So we've created these really complex juggernauts because we've all wanted to own it. And we've forgotten that the people delivering it and the people receiving it really just want a quick answer. They want to buy what they wanted to buy. They want to get to value. They want to know where their package is. Like, if you got told, hey, I'm really sorry, we actually don't know where your package is. Can I call you back tomorrow? John, I'm sure you probably would have been like, yeah, hey, that sucks, but sure, okay. And you know what would have made your experience even better? If they called you back tomorrow. Yeah, even exactly. if it was to say they still didn't know. know. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I got a 15% discount on future purchases for my trouble. Interesting. It's uh yeah it's it yeah you're right it doesn't cut to the heart heart of the the matter at all the way we've defined it currently oh well we fly um, into the good stuff I will yeah. say yeah let's, let, let, by way of segue to the good stuff I will say there are companies that are doing better at this and the consistent thread that I see is that they recognize that the way you deliver what the customer needs is you empower those frontline employees to do it. And again, this is some old school tried and true wisdom that we somehow forgot along the way. And we're finally starting to get back. So it's about empowering people, giving them a clear sense of mission, the information and the tools they need to do their jobs and trusting them to do the right thing for the customer. And that actually makes a huge difference. And by the way, it's the only way you can do this at a large enough scale and quickly enough to actually make an impact. I feel like I have to show you these just to prove that Nicole and I did not... We didn't we didn't share these beforehand and you were we were not allowed you were not that was against the rules. Because so. my number five is uh CX from home. Right. Yeah. It it's it was the capacity that we learned over this past year that if we gave our people the right tools to do their job well from anywhere, they could deliver amazing moments, amazing experiences. Doing right? business with people more than doing business right. with companies. Like that CX is literally what I have written amazing. down right here. Yeah. Exactly. Like I don't care if I I don't care if I hear my rep's dog in the background. Exactly. Or the I baby don't care. Crying. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. So but on, if she's on answering the hand, question, awesome. So on the one hand we have an amorphous metaverse being being propagandized by people who can't fix their current shitty projects which are wrecking the world through <laughs> Through undermining political elections and which is the next and show. So, yeah. so on the one hand we have that. On the other hand, we have let's empower people, let them work from home and give them the tools and the technology to make decisions. I mean, right. yeah. isn't it shocking how mundane the good stuff can be sometimes? I mean, well, it's, it's so it's so straightforward, right? It was I mean, my other one of this. We we've, we've yeah. gone through this really cool moment where 
CX has, we have seen beyond customer experience as being something that's reactive. Oh, you're yeah. mad. I have to give you a moment of delight to soothe your wounded heart because we did you wrong. Like that's reactive. That's reactive CX. But we've really entered this point of immersive CX. And the great news about that, where two people can solve a problem together. I need to buy something. The person in the store can help me do it. I am, I'm online and I can't figure out how to finish my transaction. The chatbot helps me do it, right? It's this immersive idea that when I'm in my moment as the customer, there are all these different tools available to me where yeah. I can have an immersive experience either with a community to validate my buy or with someone who's going to assist me. And here's the great thing about hopefully someday when the metaverse becomes something legitimately real and we all get excited about this idea of that immersive moment where we all stop reacting to stuff or sending people emails because they dared fill out a form and instead realize why they filled out the form yeah. and then yeah. delivering that experience, like immersing ourselves well, in our customer's journey. Is it, we're going to realize that the person who couldn't influence the election and decided to build a metaverse is building a door. He's building a door to the metaverse and painting it blue. But Al Gore didn't build the internet and Mark's not building the metaverse. It's we are, we, we as customers and the people delivering experiences are. Where the metaverse gets interesting is that it really becomes, it's an infinite universe of shared experience, immersive experiences where commerce and customer and currency exist in an infinite space together. We don't gonna, have that now. I'm going to we'll jump out of order on here and go straight okay. to my number one positive, which is, which is, so I wrote a blog post on this very recently. Um, and it, it came from a survey that Contentful did on um, e-commerce shopper trends. And it was really interesting because what struck me, and I, I'm just going to say it, it was a marketing survey. It wasn't a deep, deep market research survey, but it was actually still really interesting what came from it. And for me, the takeaway was, we are in the meta shopping era. We have entered it. And I like, don't confuse that with the metaverse. But what I'm trying to say here is we're shopping when we're not shopping. I will not tell you the statistic on how many people acknowledged having purchased something while they were sitting on the toilet, but it's, it's a significant number. Um, but you know, like we're doing, we're shopping while we're doing other things. You know, we're having a conversation over the table or, you know, maybe we're in a meeting Maybe we're in a car, Never. Hopefully, hopefully not driving. Although, you know, we both, we all know Ray. Wong, maybe so. we're we all a, know Ray. We all yeah. know Ray. It's happened. Maybe yeah. we're at an analyst day event. Per oh, perhaps. sorry. You know, oh, just sorry, a, everyone. Uh, yeah, didn't maybe. Mean but, but so, we're, so we're shopping when we're not shopping, but we're also shopping when we're already shopping. So one of the right. things that's so fascinating is how many times people are in a physical store and they're actually buying right. even from that same brand on their, you know, on their device right. while they're there, or they're researching something else, or they're talking to someone in the store who is also doing something digitally while the customer is doing something digitally in the store. I mean, so it's, so it's like layers of things here. And I think what is fascinating about this is that we're getting to a point where it's really about everything that is fun and exciting. And, you know, let's not get too hard over on the, like, hitting the dopamine button to keep buying stuff. But, you know, the, the positive experiences of shopping that are really easy and enjoyable and that mm. are mutually beneficial and that being very, very fluid. And it's not like it's yeah. online or it's offline. It's um, it's where you want it to be. And I think that and we're getting we're cool. getting back to that idea that experiences can actually lead to discoveries which yeah. is also like, we kind of lost that at the very beginning of the pandemic because everyone was looking for toilet paper. This has really turned into like the potty episode because we're talking about shopping in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. Like Brent's already uncomfortable. I get it. Like I, I understand. Oh, Sorry, Brent. Yeah. We'll talk about yeah. varmints later. But, I, uh... you know, it's it's this idea that it's not about like you can buy the next thing that was, oh gosh, it's clearly someone telling me to stop talking. Um, Anyway, it's not about buying the next thing because you bought the last thing. Right. Yeah. Like that's not personalization anymore. It really is like, here's something cool. Is yeah. that Ray? Is that Ray telling you to get off the program? Ray's probably uh, like, Hey, I'm driving. Stop uh, it. So, um, <laughs> Hey, Hey, uh, Brent, welcome. And, uh, Brent Leary's in the house. Uh, 
awesome job yesterday, Brent. Amazing. Paul Greenberg. Anyone who yeah. hasn't seen that edition of Sierra and Players, definitely check Brent's profile. That, have that you was watched like fabulous. the full? Have you watched like all of the videos, John? Like the I link? haven't watched all of them yet because I do it's have like two hours. Yet. I do have yeah. a day job, but I, 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 I'm looking forward to checking it out. In, in I feel its like entirety. we should have a viewing party. Like I really, yeah. To do those, Although actually. I need yeah. a camera though on Paul because I think the joy of CRM players was sitting there exactly. watching it to see when Paul would break. Like, yeah. when's he gonna cry? Like, he held so- up pretty good though. He was like concentrating on Yankee box scores or something because he managed <laughs> to like keep keep a straight face. But or was but- everyone just focused on Esteban and hoping that he was gonna behave? Like it was, it was like we didn't yeah, quite yeah, yeah. know because like, he was super well behaved too. I was like. It's the Paul Greenberg effect. I'm just gonna say it is. It is the Paul. You know, anyway, for for the okay. for the one or two people that showed up to hear about hybrid events, sorry, I I had to go along with the promotion. So, uh, but I, I hear that I might come back someday and talk hybrid events on on the show. So that way, it wasn't just a ruse. It. it wasn't yeah. just a marketing. That'll ruse, be a good but, one. I like that. Well, any, anyhow, um, but but Brent, welcome and uh, feel free to contribute uh, your CX highs and lows of the year because you certainly spent a lot of time looking at those issues. Um, so let's Ooh. see. We are kind of. I in got the, another high. We are in the home stretch, yeah, but we got, need, we need another one high. I want to get in. Um, okay, there is one. There is one, one thing I want to. There's one no. thing I want to say though, which is about your last comments before we got sidetracked with a little bit of a review of yesterday, which is, I think one of the really fascinating things right now in 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 the enterprise software space and software in general is when you, when you go back to the late 90s there was so much about okay we always knew that th- these problems were not just tech problems right it was always people process technology but yeah. like like so in the late 90s i started writing about what i called the extended enterprise and it was this feeling yeah okay i write about erp but i just don't think that that's going to do it we need to be more externally conscious right and but the technology wasn't there to fulfill that. And then when CRM took off a few years later, it wasn't really CRM to deal with the kinds of problems you're talking about now, right? Yeah. It, it, it it could help you with some call center management stuff like that, but it wasn't designed for all of this. And I think what's so interesting now is that while there's still some stuff we need to do with tech around predictive and all this stuff the tech isn't really the roadblock anymore to these issues that we're talking about today, right? The, the, the technology is really not the problem. Yes. You can get yourself into trouble if you choose the wrong platform and get too convoluted, but it's really more the people and the processes that are holding us back now. I think anyway, it's just an interesting thing. I I would totally, I would totally agree. And it, it actually goes back to Thomas's question right of is it cx or is it a platform and what becomes the differentiator and and i think that a lot of people went chasing a platform thinking that it would deliver cx Mm -hmm. without ever stopping and thinking that just like with crm right if you went and implemented crm like it was going to be a mystical land of joy and silver bullets flying around the place you were going to be sorely mistaken but if you had a strategy that focused around the combination of relationship building within an optimized model of Salesforce automation, and that was your strategy, you were going to kill it with CRM. Same thing is with with CX, right? If you've got a strategy around how sales is involved and how is the, you know, how is service involved, how is marketing involved, you're going to kill it with your platform. You're going to probably have to buy some duct tape and some little things that plug little holes around the way. Here and here lies the rub. I mean, there is not a black box you can buy that will do this for you. No. There are there are tools of all mm. kinds and all flavors and all descriptions. Right. And you can put them together in almost endless combinations. Probably not all of them very useful. But the point is the tools exist to your to your comment, John, to get us to where we want to be. The thing that is absolutely essential and is all too often lacking is the vision for where that place is and the imagination for how to get there. And I think, you know, this is where we're really starting to see that separation coming to the fore between the companies that have figured this out and the ones that still have no concept and are still just kind of plugging away, doing things the way that they've always done them. And and I think that gap is going to get bigger and bigger because the, the impact of getting it right is so, so big. Brent is just trying to pull my string. Brent wants to know, will, <laughs> 2000, 
Will 2022 be the year that privacy will be considered a primary CX concern? The answer is no. Um, sorry, sorry, Brent. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to was. diminish your I don't mean to diminish your question because, by the way, Brent puts on a terrific show on the topic of privacy every week on Fridays, Friday morning. It is. So it's Brent, an awesome show. Brent, there's your there's your plug for that, and it, it is a really good show. Uh, and I want to answer the question in more detail, but one thing I do want to say is Thomas. We just wrote an excellent post on the issue of platform and why sometimes platforms are insufficient. Thomas, if you could post a link to that in the chat, yeah, that would be most appreciated. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So do you want to tackle Brent's question in the context okay. of our discussion okay. here? Let's, mm, let's tackle this. Um, so privacy. So first of all, similar to an organization needing to sit down cross-functionally and coming up with a common definition of what privacy is, what it needs to be based on, and where it will then be delivered, honored, and reflected needs to happen before everyone runs out and writes a privacy policy, right? So a privacy policy is garbage you put up on your website that you hope to God gets Debbie and Bob from risk off your back. Privacy as a part of your customer experience is absolutely critical and no, it, it will not come to the forefront in 2022 because someone's going to have to get into so much trouble. They're going to have to yeah. get fined so hard. It's going to be like GDPR and CCPA and then whatever 10 other regulations are going to come out in the next six months are all going to have to send one cumulative bill to an organization for everyone to be like, oh, hot damn. So Debbie and Bob from Risk aren't the only ones that should be sweating about privacy. It should be us too. It, it, the, when GDPR came out, we all hoped that it would be the opportunity for the CIO, the CDO, the CMO, the CISO to all get together and kick the privacy can down the lane. And some organizations really did it. Some organizations sat down and thought to themselves and thought out, why is adhering to privacy respect, identifying what privacy means to our customer, what privacy means to our regulators, and how do we respect both things? How does that become a business differentiator to us? They're winning. They're the ones that aren't asking you every 10 seconds if you wanted to buy the same thing. They're the ones that aren't sending you ads in Vietnamese. Those are the organizations that are winning. It's just going to take someone being a colossal failure in a headline for everyone to realize it's a bigger issue than a lot of this stuff mm. as a security. I think it's interesting too, just real quick to say that, that sometimes it's a challenge because one of the things that could also help is to launch s sort of privacy core committed companies that compete with the behemoths that take full advantage. And, and I think the problem is it's so hard to compete with like a Facebook at scale, right? Cause there have been social networks that have been started sure. That adhere I mean, to there very are great browsers. There are great yeah, yeah, browsers yeah, yeah, out yeah. there that are that are privacy aware. But but one really interesting thing, you know, I think we're starting to see more companies like Zoho. Full disclosure, they are a Digitonomica partner, but that's not why I'm bringing them up. They 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 would I, I don't think they would come anywhere near this show as a sponsor, and that's not to make fun of Zoho. This is an unsponsored <laughs> show, and you can tell why if you watch it. Um, but um, but but Zoho is like really stake a lot of their business on on that as a core commitment. Now, one reason they can do that is that they're not a publicly traded company and they have a lot yeah. more leeway on how they can define these things. Right. Um, but um, but I think we're going to see more companies like that. The problem is that in some markets, you can't compete unless you right. cross the line a little bit, which sort of gets to Brent's point as far as when do people get fed up and when do the fines start happening, right? Because look at be look honest. at Amazon, right? Like, am I going to live without Amazon Prime? But no. if you if if yeah. people understood the extent to which they leverage your data, I think they would be shocked. And but and let's also be honest: customers don't necessarily want to live in a world of strict privacy law and regulation. No, they want the if it's right part of the experience. We're in right. Like, if you can deliver value, if you can actually give me time back in my day, because I didn't have to look through 90 pages to figure out where the flim flam was like, yeah. I, I like it. I like that personalization. I like the result of agreeing to give you my data. What organizations haven't figured out is that privacy can actually be this incredible benefit, but yeah. instead we worry about, 
oh my God, it's going to make us not be able to do all of our bad behaviors. I can't go out and buy an email list of a million people that I don't know that was created by you know, another million people who aren't being paid well that I don't know and blast the living tar out of them. So it, because, because let's be real, a lot of those demand gen marketers that are doing that are compensated for that. So do they want to lose their jobs because they can't? So there's a lot of fear and panic that comes when we start to talk about what it means to actually live and breathe by our policy and our security measures and our metrics. But at some point we're going to have to, because the legislation is so bad and wonky out there. I mean, some of the stuff that's just in recommendation that hasn't even gone to vote yet is nightmarish. Um, that Like the loopholes are crazy. It's harder to read the GDPR, but the, the bigger problem is we've also got this looming issue of so many security threats, so much data that's out there on the dark web. So like it is this really, biz- oh yeah, like faceless hoodie guy is in yeah. charge now. So, and, and I think one of the really potent questions, uh, and I don't want to get too hung up on this because we're running low on time, is like in my case, my social security number is on the dark web. So what does privacy mean in that context to me? Right. Like, like, like what, what can a company possibly do to, to protect my privacy now? Yeah. Right. You know, like, like thanks Equifax, et cetera. Right. right. Yeah. It's, like it's hard. like once, once that's, once that's out there, like now I'm in damage control mode and I'm locking down yeah. and there's, and there's nothing a company can do to really like what else could happen? Oh crap. You know, my right. email got released. Oh crap. My phone number. Well, right. my fucking social but security is that, but is already that out there. Because so. yeah. I think the other thing that we fail to recognize a lot of times when it comes to privacy um, is well, and then especially when it comes to identity, don't get me started on identity. We don't have enough time, but privacy specifically is what does privacy mean to John? Right. And right now you might think, you know what, fuck it. My, my social security numbers out there. Privacy is like cellophane for me right now, but relevance and contextual engagement, not crossing the line and being an a-hole to you. That may be where your threshold for privacy is. It's, it's another threshold that we have to respect. Well, and here's, what's interesting is Thomas's comment here. Organizations haven't figured out how to use my data in a way that is helpful to me so far. They're using it solely for their purposes. I think Liz, that that gets to your point, Liz, which I think is like, maybe there's business models that are going to emerge here where I use your data in ways that, that make your life better and, and the trust sort of builds from there. Right? right. It's, it's looking at, it's looking at privacy particularly. And as Liz absolutely accurately says, there, there are strong connections to security approaches in this way as well, but it's about looking at privacy, not as a compliance issue, but as an opportunity to really understand what in the customer experience is actually valuable and appealing to customers. Right. And it is very much about using that as a guiding principle using your customers, knowing your customers to let them indicate where the line really is. Like what is helpful? What is useful? What is absolutely not? What is beyond the pale? And that's going to vary in different circumstances, depending on the types of customers that you have, depending on the type of business that you're in, depending on the type of relationship you have with customers. All of these things are highly variable and there's not any one answer. There probably is one minimum standard, and it would be nice if we could someday get to regulation that actually made that clear and easy, but mm. none of us is holding our breath. Got it. Well, Brent, I hope that was a good answer. It certainly was a long one. <laughs> so we got that done. Do. <laughs> Any other high points that we need to hit on as far as I'm things gonna, that kind of excite you? I'm going to throw in one because as, as Liz knows all too well, and John, I think you do too. I I get fatigued, and Brent, I'm just going to reference one of your other shows here, watching Amazon. I get fatigued by the number of times Amazon is referenced as this great example of personalization, because frankly, I beg to differ. But I will say, what I have been super, super impressed by recently is Amazon delivery, um, and the delivery people who are behind that. We had snow in Big Bear earlier this week, and The Amazon delivery driver who knows where our house is because she's already been in touch with Mark for a different delivery on a different day where there was an issue, couldn't get down our street because of the snow, couldn't get to a lot of the neighborhood because of the snow, called and left messages for all of the people she had packages for to meet her in the shopping center parking lot to go and pick them up. And I will just say that 
I consider that totally above and beyond. Unexpected, um, greatly appreciated. And I will tell you that that if you haven't had deep insight into how an Amazon delivery truck is packed at the beginning of the day, it is all about delivery in order. And when that delivery driver then has to deliver not in order out of the truck in the parking lot, that is a whole different ball game, but handled with absolute aplomb. So I will say as many things as I, as I think justifiably criticize Amazon for, I absolutely think they have done something fantastically right in this. And I love it. And I say, bring it on. Yeah. What is your, oh yeah, there you go. Because we couldn't land on a last one without it basically being identical because we yeah. share a brain. So we there do. we go. Even separated by new employers, <laughs> you guys are still <laughs> united. Uh, Brent, Brent's just wrapping the privacy thing. Be open, transparent, and truthful in how I benefit and how the company benefits. It's about a real win-win, not appearance of win, but I lose. Yeah, indeed. But isn't it funny how that privacy, like that standard of privacy... You could swap out that standard for CX. Don't lie. Yeah. Don't try to convince me that I'm winning when I'm losing. Tell me that my package is lost and we don't know where it is. Be transparent. Be honest. Listen to what I'm saying and then actually answer me for what I've said. It's the same thing with privacy. But we don't think about the two things together. We actually think about privacy as being a hindrance to our CX capacity. It's because and that's it's a totally legal wrong. That's for, that's for legal to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Brent's yeah. answer. Yeah, that's totally right. If we had more time, I would want to get into a discussion about how well bots are are fitting into our, our, our goal here. Right now, I think don't. it's a real problem. So that 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 we're going to have to save perhaps for a future. Liz we'll do a whole show. AI episode. It'll be a whole AI. Can we, do, can, we, can, we, can we talk about chat more broadly? Because that was actually one of the things I had on my my hits list that we didn't quite get to. But oh, my God, it's kind of tied up in doing business with people and not with companies right. through multiple channels that honestly have been awesome. If the bot gets me to a person quickly, I'm in. I'm in. Right. But here's the, mm -hmm. here's the, here's the negative that's going to come out of it. Dear God, please do not write 19 white papers to everyone out there. If you're listening, do not write 19 white papers in January about how this is the age of, co of conversational marketing. If you stopped having conversations with your customers at some point, you were doing it wrong. Don't mm -hmm. call it conversational marketing, please. For the love of God. By the way, I realized that today's episode was not the ultimate sound quality of all of my episodes. I had technical issues that, that ruined our sound check. So we were rolling with it. And I think my verdict is it was good enough. Um, but I, yeah. but I, in general, it will be better. It's just that we didn't, we weren't able to conduct a quality sound check today. So just so you know, in the interest of CX transparency, I realized the sound experience was suboptimal. So let's, Let's just leave it there for now. Um, Nicole, you you moved. I think we need to talk about this because you did a great job of not 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 pimping your uh, new brand in this conversation. For new ride. But I think I think people do want to understand why you why why you did what you did. Um, to me. So, right. So yeah. <laughs> Specifically. Liz Liz Specifically. wants to know why you stabbed her in the back yeah. and left her dealing with Ray and Holger on her. No, I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, I, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, uh, but no, what, what made you choose this company and, and why are you excited about this and what do you think the potential is? Thanks for asking, John. Um, why did I choose this? So I am now at Contentful, uh, a company that is building a content management platform. So we think that's the next thing after a content, content management system. And I'll spare you the long story as to why, um, we're working on making it shorter. So, um, but why this company, I really like what they do. I mean, you know, I'm a content person. I pretty much always have been, like that is probably the one consistent thread throughout my career. I think it is the substance of the conversation that you're having as a business. It's what you put out into the world. It's what you're trying to say. It's what you're trying to communicate. It's what you want people to think, what you want them to do, what you want them to feel. It's all of these things, and it's it spans the ridiculous to the sublime, 
the you know soup to nuts, whatever analogy you want to fill in here, it exists in all these different all these different modes, all these different types of assets, all these different modes of engagement and channels. Um, it's pictures, it's words, it's all of this stuff wrapped into one. And it's so, so important because without that substance of the conversation that you're trying to have, the story that you're trying to tell, you, you got a bunch of nice pipes, but nothing, nothing to really communicate. So for me, I really like what this company does. And I like the way in which it is really trying to make this a more effective and integral part of the way companies work and change some of the ways of working to make that a whole lot better along the way. Um, but honestly, it's also just a fantastic group of people. Um, many of you will have heard me say before what a huge fan I am of my boss, Dina Apostolo, who runs product marketing at Contentful. Um, it's been an absolute treat and pleasure to get to go work in, with and for her. But she's representative of, honestly, everybody I get to deal with on a daily basis. So it's an awesome group of really smart, really capable people. And it's fun. We're having a good time. We're having a really good time. And I get to do a lot of the stuff that I love about being an analyst, but I also get to try to make something happen for a business in a way I haven't had a chance to do in quite a long time as well. And we've seen some, uh, I've seen some analyst buddies of mine that I would never have expected to be happy in these different roles who turn out they really like making stuff. And you can see why, why you would get joy out of that and why that would be a nice, nice change of pace from analyzing stuff and not necessarily making stuff in the same way. Um, Liz, however, she still has a beef. I know. Uh, I know. Liz, I'm sorry we're not going to be able to process all of your emotions around that today. It's a lot of rage. But... It's a lot of, I mean, I just, I, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got, we've now have the, the, the curmudgeon trifecta of myself, Holger and Doug. I think we're holding it down for, uh, yeah. the analysts with, uh, a lot of beef to air. Um, but yeah, really it was like, Wow. Thanks. Thanks there, Nicole. Well, maybe my, sh my show and your occasional uh, guest appearances on this will provide some salve to that open. Are, are you kidding? Like, are, are, like you, all you have to do is look at our phone records. We're still it's like, true. we're still, and, but then yeah. we, but now it's like talking about random stuff. Like, Hey, Nicole, I can still see the big bear airport monitor. What's going on in your backyard? Like, yeah, I, exactly. like that's how the conversations have changed. <laughs> Is so, there a new uh, RV parked across the street? What? Yeah. Yeah. So just one comment, Nicole, on your new gig. Uh, and I, and I, I realize I'm preaching to, to the choir here, but I just want to have to say this. I think uh, I was on the website and I really liked a lot of what I saw there. And I think, um, you know, sort of empowering enterprises to do a better job with content at scale, if you will, in the forms that people need them is like, I think it's a powerful thing. One thing I just really want to remind enterprises is that most of your content is really crappy and and doing it at scale is just going to make it worse and going to make more people tune you Faster out. Faster crappy. So, yeah. so this is yeah. the thing that people love all their distribution analytics and content creation yeah. tools. If, if your content's not soulful, authentic, relevant, meaningful, then it, it, it just forget about it. And just basically the bar keeps going up and up. So I just would hope that that remains part of the conversation because too often I find that it's not. And we talk about content marketing without, without reckoning with that problem. So anyway, just want to throw yeah, that it's out there. The substance versus the sausage machine, which is probably a whole separate episode for us to have at some point. Yeah, there you go. Well, that's good fodder for the next year. I want to thank everyone who has made these jugular conversations worthwhile. Uh, I, I always wanted to do something a little bit more unhinged than anyone else is doing. I believe I succeeded <laughs> in that. Uh, and I, I think there is an audience for it, which is cool. And uh, we'll, we're will we going to keep doing it if you guys are up for it. So uh, Thomas and Brent are the chat MVPs today. So thanks for that. And it's a whole we'll... unhinged episode. Thomas, yeah, Brent, like Liz, it. Nicole. They're we're like the for unhinged. unhinged. Fine. You know, I like it. I like it. So uh, let's cut our losses for now. Have a great holiday, everyone. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll face these things again in the new year together. So look forward to that. Later. Thank you, Brooke.